Namaskar, good evening everyone. I'm honored to welcome you all to this exceptional Zoom lecture marking the inauguration of Earth Science Week 2023. A groundbreaking event jointly organized by four prominent institutions, Maharashtra, Ruksha Samvardini Pune, the Applied Geology Program at the School of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Science, Goa University, Panji, the Department of Geology, St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, and the Department of Geology at the Government Institute of Science, Aurangabad. This week long celebration promises to be an extraordinary journey into the realms of earth sciences. And what sets it apart is its unique approach. For the very first time in the history of Earth Science Week, we'll explore various earth science topics through the captivating lens of philately. Philately, the study and collection of postage stamps may seem world apart from geology, climatology, and archaeology, but today we'll discover the fascinating connections that bind them together. Over the next week, we have a stellar lineup of lectures, discussions planned, all of which will delve into the intricate tapestry of our planet, its geology, climate, and natural wonders. We would like you to request to use the same link for all the sessions of the Earth Science Week. All sessions can also be viewed on Mission Devrai channel, YouTube channel. Through the medium of philatry artistry, we'll unveil the stories of Earth's transformation, the forces that shape it, and the treasures hidden beneath its surface. Thank you for your overwhelming response for this exciting journey. Now I request Dr. Bhavani Singh to introduce the guest of honor. Over to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, it's a very interesting and very uh, important event which marks the establishment of the Earth Science Week as a whole. And uh, what is better way to know from our stamps, which carries our messages also along with that. So, Professor Thakkar is presently director of Birbal Sani Institute of Paleoscience. He's a very eminent person in Kutch, uh, especially in the field of tectonics and earthquake science. Uh, he has worked on several earthquakes across the India. He has a vast experience of teaching as well as research, extending for more than 30 years, 35 years of his career. So he is a very eminent person in geomorphology also. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Thakkar to this gathering. Thank you, Professor Thakkar. And uh, uh, I'm really happy to uh, inaugurate this uh, our science week function uh, organized by these four uh, institutes. One, your uh, Maharashtra Bhuksha uh, then three departments, uh, ek, one from Aurangabad, Mumbai and uh, Goa. Uh, we there so, uh, is actually things which I just come to know. Um, this sustainable development of the uh, society and the the earth earth resources which we are exploiting and exploring since long. But we have to be sustainable in the explorations and exploitation of the earth resources. I think looking to the uh, uh, the deforest. Stations, the grass uh, of the atmosphere. This uh, idea might be came into the mind of your. Maybe uh, uh, it has been generated uh, long back uh, through several minds. Not only your father, but ultimately your father actually started this. Uh, uh, and now it is not restricted to the environmental. Uh, sustainable development, as, but it is now uh, uh, varied, it has varied aspects. That is what I come to know. And so I think you are uh, uh, into this Earth Science Week celebrations. And I think this theme of the Earth Science Week of 2023 has been uh, assigned by the geoscience, American Geosciences Institutes, if I'm not wrong. Uh, the theme is the geoscience innovating for the earth and people. Uh, it, it implies that uh, 
uh, the the earth resources which we are using uh, since the beginning of the human era uh, maybe before beyond before the human era when when five million years back then homo se homo needs earth and they started exploring each every mineral rock soil water biomass they started exploring but since then there were uh, there were several uh, several views to uh, uh, because they were they were basically uh, exploring in a very natural during the era of uh, industrial era we have been using the earth ruthlessly cutting the trees ruthlessly uh, exploiting the mineral resources our fuel resources so today uh, this particular earth science week has to be uh, very very intensive to uh, to 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 uh, educate the young children that uh, how we can use sustainably each and every resources because tomorrow when they will grow up when the new generation next few hundred years or next tens of years uh, the water will not be uh, uh, potable the the air will not be uh, the uh, i mean breathable and the soil which will be completely ruined and maybe within 100 years we will be vanished so better not late we have to be uh, cautious about uh, using the resources and that is why the theme of this uh, earth science week is geoscience innovating for the earth and people because innovations in the earth science uh, is every day every day there are some new innovations but these innovations leads us to uh, use the resources sustainably so i i am really happy uh, to Will be witness of this event today, uh, and the week will start from today onwards. I think twenty ninth of eighth October to fourteenth October. There will be series of lectures, and through these lectures, most of our uh, young minds, young uh, scientists, young uh, children, they will be aware about the uh, about about the sustainable use of our resources. so uh, so thank you very much uh, i i am really uh, uh, privileged to inaugurate this session and to be a guest of honor thank you sir thank you ajit ajit sir thank you thank you sir thank you so much sir definitely the young minds with the beautiful explanation that you gave about the innovative theme will work towards the sustainable development goals thank you sir now i'd also like to request dr bhavani singh to introduce professor mp singh thank you it's my indeed pleasure to introduce professor mp singh who is a doyan in our paleontology we can say he is a president of paleontological society of india since 2012 uh, sir has experience of more than four decades in teaching and research and his main specialty is micropaleontology and biostratigraphy i have known him he has uh, several done uh, visits in kutch uh, basin and he is he was administratively he was holding the head of the department position followed by dean of the faculty of science and then later he was also the pro vice chancellor of lucknow university sir it's our honor to welcome you on this show thank you sir i will request dr mp singh to say a few words sir thank you Thank you, Doctor Bhavani Singh. Am I audible? Yes. Sir. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Doctor Bhavani Singh, for your generous introduction. Professor Thakkar, Doctor Varthak, and other organizers, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely happy to be with you all this evening. First of all, I would like to thank organizers of Earth Science Week for giving me an opportunity to be with you all this evening. Timing of this week. long program is coinciding with the international fossil week which is being celebrated throughout the country <coughs> at various centers we in india started celebrating international fossil day since 2016 on the advice of professor jere lips 
of California University. This idea was generated at the International Paleontological Association meeting at Beijing, China. Main idea of this week-long program is to make general public and school children aware of this fascinating discipline of earth science. Dr. Ajit Vartak is doing a great service to popularize the fossil through philately since more than three decades. I have long association with him and I have an opportunity to attend his lectures on the fossil and how fossils are related to philately. He has vast collection of stamps based on fossils from all over the world. I had several occasions to attend Dr. Vartak, Dr. Vartak's interesting talk based on philately. His lectures were widely appreciated. I am sure this week-long earth science program will help to popularize earth science among general public and school children. Apart from fossils this week through philately, you will get an opportunity to listen about the rise of oceanography, history of mineralogy, climate change, volcano, dinosaurs, and archaeology. I would like to take this opportunity to emphasize about significance of establishing more paleo parks throughout the India and encourage geotourism. We in India have vast scope for geotourism. There are several geotourism places in India, but due to lack of publicity, people are not aware of. Through more and more such conferences and popular lectures, we will be able to draw attention of the concerned authorities. Apart from this, fossil sites need protection from the vandalism. Local people should be sensitized regarding the significance of these sites. I understand there are eight interesting lectures scheduled in this week-long program. I will not take much of your time as we all are eager to see the rise of oceanography through philately. Once again, I thank our organizers, especially Dr. Vartak, for giving this opportunity to me to share my views with you all. I extend my good wishes for the success of this event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable views. I'll now take an uh, honor to introduce our speaker for the day. So, Dr. Nikhil Sikwera is a in renowned structural geologist and a metamorphic petrologist based in Kalangad, Goa. She achieved academic excellence with a gold medal in MSc Applied Geology from Goa University in 2016 and completed her PhD at IIT Kharagpur in 2020 under the guidance of Professor Abhijit Bhattacharya. Dr. Sikwera is currently an assistant professor at Goa University, actively researching regional tectonic evolution and contributing to top international journals. Her diverse interests extend to astronomy, archaeology, painting, sports, including table tennis and cricket. Today, ma'am is going to talk on uncharted depths of philatelic tale of the rise of oceanography. The lecture will also be lively streamed on uh, Mission Devrai YouTube channel. I'll request Dr. Uh, Nicole to start with the presentation. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Vaishnavi, for the nice introduction. Till the time ma'am starts sharing her slide, uh, there's a request. If any doubts during the lecture, please ask them in the chat at the end of the lecture. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, the slide is visible. So good evening, everyone. And uh, it's my honor, actually, to be the first one in, to speak in this series of very interesting talks. Um, as Vaishnavi has said, my topic for today is Uncharted Depths, a philatelic tale of the rise of oceanography. Well, today I'll be telling you a story about the progression of oceanography through time. I'll be using stamps instead of normal photographs okay and uh, maybe at the end of the um, talk you can tell me how many stamps I used during my uh, talk okay so I've tried to be uh, I've tried to use as many different countries as possible and um, I hope you enjoy this talk so basically this story is to give you a glimpse of how far we have come through time about our understanding of the oceans. So uh, let's dive right in. 
um, why the oceans? So this is the Earth's week, Earth Science Week, right? But the oceans make up more than 71% of the Earth's surface, and it holds more than 96% of all of the Earth's water. So definitely a major part of the Earth and Earth science should be oceanography. Uh, oceans are called the heart of the Earth because they regulate climate. And as we'll see in the coming uh, lectures as well, it's a very, very important uh, topic today in terms of climate change. So the majority of life on Earth is aquatic. So I have a stamp to show you the diversity of life. But, you know, they say that less than 5% of the planet's oceans have been explored so far. That means that we know more about the moon today than we know about our own oceans on the planet. Okay, so oceanography is the scientific study of oceans. So who were the first oceanographers? Well, in the beginning, the oldest um, evidence, the evidence we have for the oldest oceanographers are actually coming from the Western Pacific. Okay, you know, the Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean at present on planet Earth. And we have a group of people called as Polynesians who lived on the small islands in the Western Pacific Ocean. So these people, actually, they were the most remarkable um, mariners and seafarers. Uh, and even 7,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, um, even though there was no script, they didn't have a written language, they could tell each other, talk to each other, and they explored different islands in the Pacific Ocean. So they could voyage with their small canoes, um, they stored water, they stored food, and they could live on their small canoes and travel over open oceans in search of new islands to inhabit. And these Polynesian navigators, um, they had different kinds of ships. I have shown only two kinds here, this stamp and this stamp. You can see it. And they had a very unique way of communicating to, um, to each other about where to find islands, which places are the best places to fish, etc. So what they used instead of a written language is called as a stick map or a stick chart. You can see it here. This kind of a stick chart was used to communicate their findings about different islands to each other. But how did they find this? They had no um, technology to do it. But what they did was they observed nature. And they took several cues from nature. Especially, they used the stars. Okay, So they could navigate based on the position of the stars. They observed the flight patterns of birds, especially migratory birds. And they, re they realized if the birds are flying in this direction, there should be land in that direction. So they were, were avid observers of these migratory birds. Spe they also looked at waves, different kinds, the speeds of waves, different kinds of waves. You get different kinds of waves as you approach land. So they were masters of identifying different kinds of waves as well as different kinds of fish. So you can see that, uh, I mean, they, they could identify so many different kinds of fish and predict exactly how far land would be, what would be the size of the island that they would be reaching without even stepping foot on a new island. And their prowess can be seen uh, by the fact that they reached Hawaii Islands from the coast of Australia. They reached the Hawaii Islands on the other side of the Pacific Ocean uh, in around 500 AD. Okay, that's a distance of 9,000 kilometers. Whereas the people living in America, they couldn't reach Hawaii Islands in that time even though that distance was only 3,000 kilometers. So you can see the Polynesian navigators were some of the first ocean scientists and possibly they were experts in understanding what the ocean was. 
from the Pacific Ocean, we come to the Mediterranean Sea. Now here on this side of the world, in the, you can see a map here of the Mediterranean Sea. This is Europe here and Africa is down here. There were uh, uh, people called as the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were basically uh, mariners, they were traders, and they came from what is today called as Lebanon. Here you can see in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. So they come from Lebanon and they were very skilled navigators and they could, they understood the uh, Mediterranean Sea so well and they used their knowledge to further trade throughout the Mediterranean. So you can see the arrows here, they are showing to all the places within the Mediterranean Sea where they had trade relationships. Okay, so now the Phoenician, I told you the Polynesians were 7,000 to 5,000 years ago. The Phoenicians, they were present around 1500 BCE. Okay, and they uh, today their ships are some of their ships had sunk during that time and today we through uh, marine archaeology we can find those ships and study them we can also tell from where they got their wood from how they built their ships what they carried as food in their different ships etc but although they were expert navigators you know uh, it said that they were very cunning their um, goal of moving around through the Mediterranean Sea and a little bit of the Atlantic Ocean was not to inhabit new places. They wanted to trade with different people. So the Greeks tried to follow them many times and try to learn their trade routes so that they could uh, become the masters of the trade instead of the Phoenicians. So what the Phoenicians used to do is they used to uh, sail their ship very close to the shore, like here or here. They used to sail very close to the shore and the Greeks or other countries, their ships would come and they would run aground in those shallow waters. And the Phoenicians, they knew that land, they knew the ocean so well that they could get out from there and go. So uh, they never shared their secrets with other people except a few uh, with the Greeks. Okay, but usually they kept their knowledge to themselves. They had a vast library um, with more than 100,000 books in their library. Okay, these are some of the Phoenician ships and they were the most advanced ships for uh, that particular time. So they also used the sea, they also used the waves, the stars and coastal landmarks to go from place to place. So the Greeks, using uh, some of the knowledge from the Phoenicians, they also tried to sail around the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, they, are, they are known basically because they recorded their uh, voyages in different mythologies and epics. So especially Homer's Odyssey, maybe some of you have read about it. So um, these stories, like their mythologies, tell about their understanding of the oceans. They understood currents within the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Okay, And uh, they also had some far-fetched ideas, like there were big monsters at the edge of the sea and so forth. But their understanding was uh, much advanced for their time. Uh, the first maps of the ocean of uh, the Mediterranean Sea with the surrounding land was also produced by the Greeks. And uh, this person, Anaximander, he is often credited as one of the first cartographers to produce such a map. You can see uh, such a map. I don't think it's his particular map, but these kind of maps were produced by the Greeks and they were the first to, to produce maps to map the uh, seas and the oceans, okay? Uh, they didn't just produce maps. They also, uh, like people like Aristotle, they also understood other aspects of oceanography, such, that, such as evaporation is equal to precipitation. So Aristotle observed that the sea never dried up. So although they had, uh, although he understood evaporation be because they used to heat water to cook where it's to evaporate, 
the sea never dried up even though so much of sunlight was falling on it so he understood that somewhere evaporation should be equal to precipitation over the uh, surface of the earth okay and uh, the maps i was talking about the maps one of the maps by this person ptolemy um, ptolemy was one person you can see the uh, stamp here he realized that the earth is not flat like the rest of the civilizations believed that the earth is flat he realized it's not flat it's in fact a sphere and he could even calculate the circumference of the earth there was a slight difference because the earth today we know is not exactly spherical it's a little bit oblate in shape but uh, he's calculations came very very close and we use his ma his maps were used even 1200 years after he had produced them a small uh, anecdote about this stamp here i found it very interesting it was one of the most famous greeks i think you will know uh, alexander the great so alexander the great the, the great conqueror so he was also he also played a small part in oceanographic studies so once he went to the mediterranean sea and he asked he uh, his shipmates to lower him into the sea you can see the stamp here and he is being lowered in a glass uh, sphere into the mediterranean sea and here through this glass sphere he observes a lot of different marine life and different fishes and he also came up with a story that there was one fish that was so big that it took 3 days for the entire fish to cross this sphere and uh, move from head to tail okay so this was the greeks understanding about the mediterranean sea well when the greeks were uh, on this side indians were also doing their bit uh, and i'm sure uh, the chief guest for today he has also worked on uh, this port called as lothal port in gujarat uh, in the in, in india we had the one of the oldest civilizations called as the indus valley civilization and the indus valley civilization was along the um, indus river um, but the people of the indus valley civilization they didn't just navigate over the river they also navigated through the sea and that evidence came from some terracotta tiles in this place called as lothal okay so lothal in gujarat they found that it was a ancient port of the indus valley people and you can see that uh, the government of india also published a stamp this is the terracotta tile on which there is a imprint of the ships of that time okay so obviously in even indians were very um, proactive in terms of going out and uh, sailing through the oceans so the lothal port is about 2400 to 1900 uh, it's found between this or it uh, was prevalent during this time 2400 bc um and at that point of time there were usually single sail ships in the indian ocean which were of the indus valley civilization uh also interestingly uh there was some discoveries of uh malabar wood which was found in babylon in ur very far away in the middle east okay so these this wood could only be taken to babylon through a sea route and this proves that e even in the indian ocean there were several people uh, or several sailors that could uh, sail through the indian ocean and even 5000 years ago to bring uh, material from india to the middle east okay and through time there were uh, more developments more uh, the design of the ships got better and this is recorded in the ajanta cave uh, the carvings in the ajanta caves so around which is around 600 uh, it was done around 600 ad so in the ajanta caves they show that 
the ships from a single sail they uh, are developed to triple sail ships so there's also an advancement that is proved there and besides the uh, indus valley civilization after their decline there were other dynasties in the indian subcontinent who also tried to keep a naval presence and uh, one of the most famous ones was uh, king ashoka who sent several missionary buddhist missionaries to uh, sri lanka to uh, java indonesia malaysia to spread buddhism so they could uh, definitely they had the prowess uh, and they had good ships that could traverse these oceans and the indian ocean another king was the king rajendra chola of the chola dynasty and uh, king chola, rajendra chola one this was a stamp in his uh, honor so you can see he had also very advanced ships for his time and he also sailed through the indian ocean towards indonesia and uh, malaysia vietnam etc and this was mostly done for trade and to further the religion well india is moving through the oceans and so was china during that time so the china uh, the chinese actually had a very very interesting invention uh which we know today to be the magnetic compass so you can see these were the ancient magnetic compasses developed by the chinese uh and they are commemorated on these stamps okay so the chinese developed great uh or they could go very far in the oceans because of this compass they didn't need specific landmarks to see which side they were sailing they could do it with the help of their compass so they had they transformed navigation and seafaring with this invention of theirs and they also had the, uh, the capability to build very very big ships so they built these huge ships more than 400 feet in length okay they were called as chinese junks and they used to sail around um uh, the coasts of china come down to indonesia they even sailed in the indian ocean they came to india went to the went to arabia and even reached africa one of the most famous admirals of these voyages was admiral zheng he in the 15th century so sailing these big huge ships was not a joke but still they had they could do it and there was only one problem but when they were sailing around they didn't really have a goal to or they didn't have any aim towards uh, going to these different uh, oceans so basically they uh, they didn't they didn't look for treasure they didn't look to conquer new land they didn't look to have uh, uh, or spread their religion so there was no real goal and these uh, voyages they cost a lot of money so soon they had to be stopped and therefore you don't hear about chinese junk ships later um, after the 15th 16th century so much so you can see this is a stamp of showing all the different routes that were taken during the ming dynasty um, to show uh, uh, china's maritime exploration okay so while india and china during the first 1000 years ad still had naval presence what was happening in europe was um the romans had conquered most of the places in europe and some of the places in middle east and these romans they were they were against or i could say they did not encourage maritime exploration so they destroyed the library of the phoenicians they destroyed ports and ships and their main uh, i mean they they only concentrated on land routes for trade so you can see in this stamp this is the trade routes that they use this is the silk road which is called uh, it's called as a silk road and it comes down to india and china okay so the silk road was used for trade during the roman times so up from 0 to 1000 ad very little was done in europe uh, in terms of um, ocean science 
works. But then something happened by the middle of the 15th century. This silk, the silk road started getting blocked. Okay, this was because of several factors. One of them was a decline of the Mongol Empire. And one major reason also was that the Turks had captured this main city of Constantinople, which is located over here. Um, and this was the city that all trade had to pass through to reach India. Okay, so from Europe. So basically, when the Turks captured this place, they imposed a lot of taxes on any material that was going to India or coming from India. So suddenly there was an urge in Europe to find new trade routes to, to uh, overcome this problem of this increased taxes. Okay, and that was the age of discovery, the Renaissance and the age of discovery for the people of Europe. So we'll see what happened during this age of discovery. So the first thing was they had to find new trade routes because the Silk Road was shut. So when they were looking for the new trade routes, they found that it is very cheap to go via the sea. Okay, so via the sea, um, they started spending uh, money to build better ships and they had they tried to get better instruments for navigation. And uh, one of the first persons to um, discover different new places was Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal. He discovered several places in Africa which the Europeans did not know about before. And Prince Henry, the navigator, he also set up the first school for navigation in 14 AD, uh, 1418 AD. So after setting up the school, more and more people, uh, more and more sailors could uh, study and, uh, you know, try to come to know about how to sail in open oceans. And the fallout for this, their search for trade routes was successful. Uh, one uh, which we all know about is Vasco da Gama. So this uh, man Vasco da Gama of Portugal, he sailed uh, across the, uh, not across the Atlantic, he sailed through the Atlantic and across the Cape of Good Hope in Africa and he sailed to India. Okay, so he was the first person who came to India via a, a sea route and this was a very difficult voyage. He sailed with three ships, okay? But his main aim was first to um, further trade. He did not come with a uh, expectation of colonization or something, but later on, uh, I mean, with they found out that they could defeat the Indian kings over here. And also that became a uh, part of this entire exercise of finding trade routes. So. Although they, they uh, went for trade and they went to um, colonize, they, a lot of new information was found out about the oceans because of this quest. So they found out that there were... Hello? Is it okay? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay. So they found out that, you know, there was something called as a monsoon winds. It can help you to reach India at particular times of the year. If you go at wrong time, then the current would be against you. So a lot of new information about the oceans was generated during this, um, during this quest for new trade routes. The other famous person uh, was this Christopher Columbus who sailed to the Bahamas he, uh, in 1492. So Christopher Columbus had this great idea that instead of going around the uh, Cape of Good Hope of Africa, why don't I sail in the other direction? And at some point of the other or the other, I will come to India, right? So instead of going east, he sailed west. And he crossed the Atlantic Ocean and he reached a new land, which immediately he thought was India. And uh, it was actually the Bahama Islands. Okay, and Christopher uh, Columbus, he uh, started, I mean, he, he tried to get trade started because of, uh, uh, through this new route with what he called as the New India. But 
I'm sure most of us know that this land is not India, right? Christopher Columbus did not reach India. He reached a land which we today call as America. Ever wondered why America and not Colombia, which after Christopher Columbus, that place should have been called as Colombia, right? But this is not the case because America is named after a different person called as Amerigo Vespucci. So Amerigo Vespucci was another uh, sailor. He didn't actually start out as a sailor. He was an he was an accountant. Okay, and then he started a business, and he became friends with Christopher Columbus. He also took care. He fixed some of Christopher Columbus's ships when he came back. Um, and uh, uh, from this uh, association with Christopher Columbus, Am uh, Amerigo Vespucci also sailed the same route to the what we now know as America. So basically, this land is named after Amerigo because Amerigo was the first person to understand that this is not India. Columbus did not reach India. He reached an entirely uh, previously unidentified continent. So he could, Amerigo Vespucci found this out by studying the night sky, actually. And he found that the constellations here, uh, where he, when he reached Brazil, he found that the constellations in the night sky did not match with the constellations that he was seeing in the Northern Hemisphere. Also, he had read about uh, Marco Polo's adventures in China and in India. And uh, he was uh, very much inspired by Marco Polo. So he knew what to expect when you go to India or China. And uh, when he came to Brazil, he saw it was completely different from what he thought it would be. So he realized that this was not India at all. It was a new continent. And therefore, because he identified it as a new con continent, he uh, this uh, these two continents are named America, the feminized version of his name, uh, after Amerigo Vespucci. Okay, so his, uh, he sailed in 1501 to the Americas. Uh, another voyager called as Ferdinand Magellan. So Ferdinand Magellan was the first person from Europe to circumnavigate the globe. So that means that he sailed around the world and he did it way back in 1519 to 1521. So Ferdinand Magellan, uh, you can see this is Ferdinand Magellan. And this is, the, this is his ship, which he used. He actually took five ships for his voyage and he had a very, very tough voyage to sail around the world. So he first went to, from Spain, he sailed to South America. And from South America, he actually tried to find a way without going to the tip of South America. Maybe somewhere there was a river that cross-cut the continent and he could sail through that river instead of going right down south to the tip of South America and sail across that. But he did not find any river that cross-cut this continent. And during this search, he lost a lot of men and a lot of his crew started rebelling against him. And finally, when he tried to cross the tip of South America, you know, it's very cold over there, very uh, high winds are there. So it's very, very difficult to cross. And the place where he crossed today, it's called as the Strait of Magellan after him. Okay, so the place he crossed, he had to uh, kill one of his uh, co-captains of another ship because he started fighting against him. He And he uh, kept some crew members uh, on land because they were also very unhappy with his uh, voyage. So he had a lot of trouble. But anyway, he sailed through the Strait of Magellan, crossed South America and entered the Pacific Ocean. His crew was suffering from a lot of seasickness. They had scurvy, which is a disease you get uh, because of lack of vitamin C. And they had no food on the ship. But Magellan was very, very determined that he would circumnavigate the globe. So he sailed to Philippines and he managed to cross the Pacific Ocean. And what happened was in Philippines, 
he when he tried to uh, talk to the locals on the philippine islands the tribals over there he had he tried to convert some of them to christianity and one of those tribal men they killed him so although we give him the credit of circumnavigating the globe he actually did not complete that voyage the one ship that was left from that voyage that ship managed to come back to spain so the entire voyage was successful but ferdinand magellan by himself did not circumnavigate the globe because he was killed in philippines before he could reach spain now when these different uh, uh, these different explorers were coming to india well it's not that india indians did not know anything about the sea right so there were several admirals in india especially along south india the zamorin of uh, in kerala they had a army or a navy rather with several advanced ships who fought against the portuguese when they came so their admirals were called as the marakhars or the kunjalis and these kunjalis there were four kunjalis kunjali 1 2 3 and 4 they fought against the portuguese so they had the enough knowledge about their coast about their sea to fight and many of them won against the portuguese as well uh sadly the last kunjali kunjali 4 was captured by the portuguese because the portuguese cunningly tricked the zamorin and told the zamorin that you know the kunjali is against you not for you and the zamorin uh, gave him up to the portuguese and this kunjali 4 was brought to goa and he was beheaded in goa so the admirals of the uh, india were also uh, recognized through these stamps that india published uh, as their maritime heritage okay now all this navigation across around the world to different parts of different continents they could not be done if there was no instruments that uh, helped them there were discoveries of several instruments uh, and equipment that helped these navigate that helped these explorers to navigate the oceans so i have shown several uh, uh, stamps of these different instruments i don't know how all of them work but uh, some of them this is called the astrolab astrolab it was used to find the latitude with the help of the uh, the stars so with the help of the stars the astrolab was used to help uh, to see which latitude you are on on the uh, on the earth as the astrolab then was uh, developed into the quadrant and the quadrant became the sextant so these are all pictures of the sextant and the sextant then was converted to the octant so this is called as the octant these are instruments which you could use to find which latitude on the earth you are so these were instruments which were used for navigation besides these of course there were there were no clocks you have to uh, understand this was the 15th century early 16th century there were no clocks no watches so they used to keep time with the help of hour glass so then hour glass was there so they had this simple compass scales etc so these were also other simple instruments and this is called as the armillary sphere so this particular it looks small here but it is a very big instrument um so this sphere helped you to not only find your latitude which can be done by the other instruments it also helped you to find the longitude so these were the discoveries of different or inventions of different instruments that could help you navigate the oceans there were other uh, discoveries later on one of the most important discovery was by this person called as gerard mercator so mercator uh, any geologist here then they will uh, appreciate that mercator was the one who developed the mercator projection so he projected a 3d sphere on a 2d plane using grid lines so we can have now 2d accurate maps even though the earth is a sphere 
So this uh, was one very, very important uh, discovery. And we use this Mercator projection even today to show the world maps. Um, there were other inventions like also the barometer by uh, Torricelli of Italy. This is Mr. Torricelli. So the barometer, it measures atmospheric pressure and uh, they used it on the ships to see uh, if there's a, a storm that is coming or a cyclone that's coming towards their ship, you know, atmospheric pressure changes. So this can be used on the ship so that they are ready for that whatever weather phenomenon that they are going to face. So it was very helpful. And one of the most, most helpful inventions was the chronometer. The chronometer was invented by uh, John Harrison in 1735. So these are all uh, stamps of the chronometer. Okay. And uh, this chronometer is basically what you, if you have analog watches and clocks today, it is derived from John Harrison's chronometer. Okay. So we have to thank John Harrison. Not only was it used on ships, it we also use it today. And because the chronometer could keep time so accurately, uh, it was possible to also, in some indirect ways, to find which longitude you are on and uh, on the Earth's surface, not only which latitude. So it was very important for navigation. So that was all that was taking place during the age of discovery. Now we move on to the age of enlightenment, which occurred during the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe. Now, during the age of enlightenment, uh, the trade routes were established, several colonies were established, and different philosophers and thinkers started giving emphasis on science and reasoning uh, rather than just going for um, you know, to further their wealth of the particular country. So they tried to find, they uh, then went to scientific exploits and there were several people who discovered different things about the ocean. So some few, I will name only very few. Uh, Lord Kelvin, I'm sure everybody knows him here. Whoever has have studied science even in school, he discovered the Kelvin scale. But Lord Kelvin, his uh, name was Sir William Thompson. Uh, he found a way of sounding, he, he invented a sounding machine which could map the sea floor accurately. So up to now, most of the expeditions or most of the knowledge about oceans was restricted to the surface of the ocean. There was very little knowledge about what is happening at the bottom of the ocean. So Sir William Thompson or Lord Kelvin, he was the first one to make a reliable sounding machine, which would help to map the sea floor up to at least a certain depth. Another very, very famous uh, scientist was, uh, or chemist was called Robert Boyle. I'm sure you know Boyle's law. So Robert Boyle also made several uh, observations about the saltiness of the sea and he did experiments to find out why the saltiness changed very little and uh, and so forth. So Robert Boyle also helped further our understanding about oceans. Another very famous personality a true uh, all-rounder, if you can call him, was Benjamin Franklin. Now, this is a stamp of Benjamin Franklin. So, you know, he's one of the founding fathers of the United States of America. And he was a scientist. He was also a postmaster, by the way. And um, he uh, found or, or he published the earliest map of the Gulf Stream. So, you can see this is a map. I don't, I couldn't find a stamp of it. So this is just the, the map he's drawing. So you see, this is the East Coast of America and this is the Gulf Stream, um, which can be used by ships to move along the coast of America. Okay, so Benjamin Franklin was the first one to map this particular Gulf Stream. And as the Age of Enlightenment went for, uh, forward, 
we come to one of the first scientific expeditions which was carried out by somebody called as captain james cook so captain james cook um he is a very uh, enigmatic personality so this is how he looked you can see he is a very tall good looking man and uh, basically he was an admiral or he was a officer in the british navy and when he was a young man he uh, learned to uh, he learned sailing in the north sea okay so in the north sea which is north of england uh, it's a very rough sea and you know you can predict you can't really predict uh, the weather at all points of time it can turn very rough very soon so captain james cook he learned to navigate through the north sea and with this once he mastered that he lost the fear of the sea so he said if he can navigate in the north sea he can navigate anywhere in any sea in the world so he was so confident about his skills um, and when he joined the english navy okay so he also worked there but sadly for some reason or the other he was not promoted uh, very soon although he was very good and he used to study maths at night astronomy at night and he should con conduct his naval duties in the morning so he was he was a very uh, uh, i mean he did a lot of things during his career so when this all this uh, scientific investigations were needed to be done in the oceans so britain first chose the the royalty first chose james cook to captain their first scientific ex expedition uh, and this expedition <laughs> funnily it was not really for oceanographic purposes they wanted to track the transit of venus across the sun which could be done uh, which couldn't be done in england so they wanted uh captain james cook to sail closer to america and track this uh transit of venus okay and this would help uh to calculate the distance between the earth and the sun so captain james cook since he knew astronomy also he was chosen to be the captain of this voyage and uh he took with him uh somebody called as joseph banks who was a naturalist and uh they went on there were of course many other people and they went on their first voyage it was a uh, on a ship called as the endeavor there was another uh, i forgot to say there was another uh, reason also or, or another goal that was given to captain james cook was to find the landmass at the bottom of the earth so till then nobody knew whether there was a continent at the south pole of the earth so captain james cook was given the task to find what they called at that point of time terra australis so uh, he was supposed to find whether there was land or not at the bottom of the earth okay so he sailed through the atlantic he sailed across the south uh, southern tip of south america he came to australia in his first expedition he mapped all the islands of new zealand within one month okay that's how good he was and instead of turning back from here he continued forward and he sailed through uh, along the coast of australia through the great barrier reef to to indonesia and then back to europe through the indian ocean okay so you can see his voyage here shown in the red line in this uh stamp okay so he was uh, i mean he was a master navigator and from his voyage there were several uh, new discoveries also that were made especially of all these islands in the pacific ocean and you have islands named after him as the cook islands in the pacific ocean okay so he had three voyages so because his first voyage was so successful he undertook another two voyages uh, with a different boat his first boat was called as endeavor his next boat was called as resolution okay so with resolution he uh, undertook other uh, two other expeditions which were also very very successful but the last expedition 
he was asked to find out a northern route across america so basically he was asked to find out this route from atlantic to come this side okay so he sailed across south america came up north and he was trying to find a route this side obviously there is no route that exists there but during this expedition on one of the islands in hawaii uh, because of some small skirmish over one uh, blade he was killed by uh one of the hawaiian tribal people and he lost his life over there so that was captain james cook okay so there are a lot of stamps uh that uh, are uh, published in his uh, honor okay you can see this stamp is of his second voyage and his second voyage he went close to the southern continent of antarctica he was the first person to say that there was land in antarctica okay it's not just ice but he could not reach the land but his voyage showed that there was a continent at the southern uh, tip of the world okay so this was captain james cook and from captain james cook such so his success um it inspired more and more uh, scientific discoveries and and you know britain started sending uh, scientists and naturalists on all their ships to make uh, uh, discoveries and one of the most famous of those i don't think i should spend a long time uh, on this person charles darwin so we all know charles darwin he was the naturalist on the ship called as the hms beagle and he sailed to south america and around south america and from this voyage he um, put forward his theory of evolution so this is an a map of in, a stamp of india in to commemorate charles darwin okay so i'm not spending a long time on him but we'll see a few other people who maybe we have not heard so much about okay while most of camp james cook charles darwin they were all englishmen even in america you know by this time they had already received their freedom okay so even in america they had set up institutes to study oceanography and one of their uh, most famous persons is uh, is one naval officer called as matthew mori so this is matthew mori okay so he is known as the pathfinder of the seas he started out as a naval officer and he was injured in a war and because he was injured on the war he couldn't stay on the ship anymore and they gave him a desk job in some uh, some office somewhere some uh, very rural place and you know they thought we would not hear about this person anymore but matthew mori he studied all the the navigation charts log books of the sailors which he got in that office and he produced new navigation charts better navigation charts and he he could predict better routes for ships okay so um he made great contribution to navigation navigation paths through the different oceans he also produced maps of the atlantic ocean floor up to certain depths by uh, inventing a sounding machine as well as sampling rocks from the bottom of the atlantic ocean okay so he uh, had different vessels or samplers that could pick up rocks from the bottom of the ocean and he could create a map of the atlantic floor ocean floor and another thing that he was that he did was he was instrumental in having the first international meteorological conference in 1853 okay so all these were reasons that today he is called as the father of physical oceanography that is matthew mori now as the world was as world i can say europe was moving more towards understanding the science behind the oceans and actually oceanography was beginning the most important expedition was the challenger expedition that was sent out to find different aspects or study the oceans 
scientifically. It was the first expedition solely for understanding oceans. So basically, they were sent out on this expedition and told, find out everything you know or everything you can about the sea. There's no restriction. It doesn't have to be physics related, chemistry, biology. It can be, it should be everything. So the captain of this expedition was Sir Vival Thompson. And he had on board a naturalist called as Sir John Murray. So these two men and their crews, they sailed all the oceans except the Arctic Ocean. Okay. And they conducted several experiments. You can see this is um, Sir uh, Vival Thompson. This is Sir John Murray. These, this is the route they took through the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, here are their instruments on board. So they collected lots of sam water samples, measured temperatures, pressures. They uh, got different marine life uh, samples, I mean, species. They also put a net in the ocean and they just dragged it behind the ship. And whatever uh, fish got stuck, they would just pull it behind the ship. And then when they reached back, okay, so uh, to, when they reached back to London, they had so much of information about all the uh, all their entire expedition that it filled more than 50 volumes, um, which were all curated by Sir John Murray. Murray. So there was a lot that was learned about the oceans from uh, this Challenger expedition. So Sir John Murray is today known as the father of modern oceanography. This is him here. And then what happened? So individual ex expeditions were getting expensive. So basically countries started setting up entire institutes to study oceans, okay? So these were the setting, uh, setting up of different oceanographic institutes. Uh, USA was uh, the first country to set up several institutes and some of their most famous institutes are the Scripps Institution of, Ocean, Inst of Oceanography, which they set up in 1903, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, it's called WHOI, in 1930. So this is a postcard of uh, WHOI, okay, the Woods Hole Institution. So besides America, there was also in Europe, there was a prince called as Prince Albert the first. And Prince Albert, he was an oceanographer himself. And uh, he did not much like to rule over his country, which was Monaco. So he spent a lot of time on the seas. And he also founded the Oceanographic Institute in Paris in 1906. And the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco in 1910. This museum is still open today and it has one of the most vast collections of ocean species on the planet. Okay, so Albert the first, uh, don't get confused, Albert the second is the present Prince of Monaco. This is Albert the first who was the oceanographer in 1906. He set up these institutes. I will also mention here that after India's independence in 1947, India also set up institutes to study the oceans. Okay, and one of that is located in Goa, which is the National Institute of Oceanography or NIO. There are other institutes as well. So other countries, including India, also set up institutes to study, study the oceans. A special mention about this person called as Nansen. Okay, Nansen was a Norwegian explorer and a very dynamic personality. You can see he was born in, 19, in 1861 and died in 1930. So he was an explorer who uh, people thought to be a madman, but, <laughs> but he had several discoveries and made. He also uh, went on several expeditions to the Arctic Ocean, to the Arctic. He came very close to, to the North Pole and he discovered uh, several, or he invented several things. One of them was a water sampling bottle, 
which could collect water samples at different depths without getting contaminated. So this was fridge of Na uh, Nansen. So uh, Nansen actually he was uh, he also did some crazy stuff like he built a ship called as Fram, which was the first icebreaker ship of his time. And he went and he sailed the ship into the ice sheet at the Ar Arctic in the Arctic. And the, the ship got stuck in the ice sheet. And Nansen just, you know, stopped all the engines and everything. And he just the, floated, floated along with the ice, the ice sheet. And he tracked the movement of the ice sheet along with the ship. Okay, so he was ready to go to several lengths to find out, I mean, to, to get information. Um, and that's how he could uh, test hypothesis about the Arctic currents because he got his ship purposely stuck in an ice sheet and drifted for several, three, four months uh, to find out uh, how the currents moved in the Arctic. Okay, he also later in life, he was, he also became a statesman. Uh, he, in fact, he also fought in the First World War, but he was very much against war and then he uh, tried to settle a dispute between Norway and Sweden. And he was um, elected as the head of the, of the Norway delegation to the League of Nations. The League of Nations was the um, first institute before the United Nations uh, came up. So the League of Nations was there after the First World War and Frederick uh, Fridjof Nansen was the head of the delegation for Norway. And because of his work to maintain peace in Norway and Sweden, Sweden he was given the uh, Nobel Prize for Peace in 1922. So very dynamic personality. Uh, then we come to uh, another Norwegian, uh, oh, sorry, another German uh, called as Alfred Wegener, and who was a meteorologist to make one of the most, can I say, earth shattering discoveries uh, or hypothesis called as the continental drift theory. So Alfred Wegener, as I said, he was a meteorologist. And because there were so much, so many expeditions to the uh, poles, North and South Pole, he also went to Greenland and he was trying to do some experiments on the weather over there in Greenland with some, using some uh, balloons and so forth. So he discovered that, you know, uh, he saw several evidences such as matching coastlines across the Atlantic Ocean. He saw that rocks on in Africa matched with the rocks in South America. Fossils of uh, tropical plants which are found close to the equator, fossils of those are found close to the poles today. So using this evidence, he put forward a theory called as the continental drift theory, which said that all the continents in the past made up one single supercontinent, which he called as Pangaea. Okay, so this proposition was put forward in 1912. After that, the First World War broke out in 1914. Alfred Wegener fought in the war. He was injured in the war and he was in the hospital for more than six months. And he used this time to write out the theory of continental drift, which was later translated to several different languages. Okay, so the continental drift theory, it tries to also explain changing ocean basins, produce production of ocean basins, eating up of ocean basins, and the Earth's climate regulations. Okay, so Alfred Wegener, because he was a meteorologist, geologists did not like that a meteorologist can tell them how the earth works and how the rocks move. So his theory was not accepted so, uh, I mean, so, so easily. Okay, so he was ridiculed. Um, I'll just also make a mention, before Wegener in 1912, independently, there was another person called as Dr. Alex Dutoit from, uh, from South America, who also had predicted a supercontinent in the past. Okay, he also talked about continental drift, but uh, Mr. D uh, Dr. Dutoit was not given the recognition because 
uh, his publications did not you know uh, were not spread out to many different places but he actually should be given um, some credit because he proposed this continental drift theory before alfred wegener and south africa today has a stamp in his honor as well okay so continental drift theory was just trying to shake up our understanding of the ocean floors and of the continents when the two world wars broke out and the world wars were very very devastating all research civilian research stopped during the world wars but a lot of information and was collected uh, by the navies and a lot of there was a huge advancement in ocean technology because this this war was also fought in the sea in submarines uh, especially in world war 2 okay so techniques to identify submarines in the water such as sonar became uh, i mean came to use they were discovered and then it was found out that you know this technologies could also be used to understand the sea floor and uh, different aspects about the seas but a lot of this knowledge was classified and it was very difficult to get the information until the late 1950s so after the late 1950s when the information was declassified there was a new theory that was put forward and it is called as the theory of plate tectonics so i am sure uh, most people here would have heard about have heard about this <laughs> yeah okay have heard about this plate tectonic theory it was put forward by uh, professor harry hess of princeton university as the sea flow spreading theory first which developed into the plate tectonic theory so basically i was very very su pleasantly surprised that even this plate tectonic theory has uh, stamps in its honor so you can see um, this is a stamp from the solomon islands it explains that the earth the the outer surface of the earth is made up of different plates and these plates constantly move they collide they diverge okay and they move under one another also so this is the subduction zone where one plate moves below the other in this subduction zone you you produce a trench so you can see the tonga trench is shown in another map where plates move apart you get a mid oceanic ridge so you can see that in this particular stamp here as well as the transform faults which offset the ridge okay so this is all part of the plate tectonic theory which explains in totality how the continents are moving and how the different plates are moving over the surface of the earth we today also um, accept the continental the plate uh, tectonic theory and um, this was put forward first in the 1960s okay so now we have a fair understanding about the geology of the uh, oceans we know a little bit about the chemistry we know a little bit about the physics but you know there was still very little known about life in the oceans so uh, there was a theory i am forgetting which year it was in it was called as the azoic theory where uh, where somebody put he said that i think his name was edward uh, he said that life up to a certain depth in the ocean cannot be possible so there is no possibility of life up to after a certain depth in the ocean and he called it the azoic theory i believe but um uh, as more and more discoveries were being made okay uh people also went out and and they uh invented new uh instruments and new uh submersibles and remotely operated vessels called as rovs uh, where you can send people to the bottom of the sea uh, and i and look around make observations and look for life so the first of these deep sea explorations was done in 1930 by two people william bead and otis barton uh, 
So they were basically, they took a ship out, put out a, a, a steel sphere here and they looked out through the steel sphere and they could see that there was life at quite a depth, more than 1000 feet below the surface. They still could see that there was life. Okay, so this was the first kind of a bathysphere that was developed, but this was attached to a ship. So later on, they had uh, they had submersibles, which like submarines could go on their own and they didn't need to be attached to anything. Okay, and in 1960, Jacques Picard and Donald Walsh, so they went in this particular submersible called, uh, it's called a bathyscape Trieste. So the Trieste, they took it to the deepest point on the within the world's ocean, the Mariana Trench. And they discovered that there is life even there in the deepest part of the ocean. So that was done in 1960 through this deep sea exploration. Another very famous explorer was Robert Ballard. So Robert Va Ballard was from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And he made a submersible called as Alvin, which is here. He also had a remotely operated uh, vehicle, which didn't need people to sit in it. But through a remote, you can take it to different parts of the ocean. And his explorations, he found uh, the hydrothermal vents, which are close to mid-oceanic ridges. You can see a stamp of those hydrothermal vents, which have their own ecosystem surrounding these vents. Uh, which don't need sunlight or oxygen to live. And he also, Robert Ballard, also discovered the wreck of the Titanic in the, in the year 1985. So these were some other stamps which show some other deep sea exploration vessels. Okay, so you can see there are spherical, elongated ones, several e equipment is put. And you also have this kind of robotic ones which can go and pick samples from the ocean floor. Uh, the life in the deep seas is very, very fascinating. I know very little of it as a geologist. So I've just, I mean, there are a tremendous number of stamps that show the life as well. Some of the stamps are uh, also glow in the dark. Okay, so there are special stamps like that. So these are just some of the life, life forms in the deep in the deep sea so you can see they are very very fascinating okay and uh, yeah i think we'll move on okay close to the end i will make a quick mention about this person called as jacques Cousteau. so he's one of the most when you say oceanography at least in the western world immediately they know this person jacques Cousteau, because jacques Cousteau, although he was a french naval officer he uh, he wanted to be a pilot, but he got injured and fractured both his arms. And, you know, to get well, he started diving in the sea. And as soon as he saw the sea life, he was so fascinated. And then he said he's going to become a diver. So he, Jacques Cousteau, he invent, co-invented uh, an instrument called as the aqua lung, which helped divers to remain underwater for a long time. And... Um, he also was a very staunch conservationist. He made several TV shows for normal people like you and me, civilians, to understand marine life. And in the 1970s, he was the one voice for the conservation of the oceans. Okay, so through his TV shows like The Silent World, he brought marine life and conservation issues on a globe to the global audience. Today, oceanography is a multidisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary subject. Okay, it varies from remote sensing, okay, where a lot of the properties of the oceans are uh, measured through satellites, especially ocean currents, sea surface temperatures, uh, phytoplankton blooms, circulation patterns. All this is um, measured through satellite remote sensing techniques. You can see India also uh, has put out two satellites, Basker 1 and Basker 2, which made such uh, measurements. And uh, so therefore, modern oceanography is not a simple subject. It has 
it combines physics, biology, chemistry, geology uh, to understand the entire ocean and we still know very, very little about it. Okay, I will end with one slide, which is very special to me uh, about women in oceanography. Now, up to the 1970s, 1970s, women were not allowed on ships. Okay, so women were not allowed as uh, any sort of explorers or on any sort of expeditions, women were not allowed until the late 1960s and 1970s. So therefore, most of the names you heard before in this talk were all men. Okay, but there were a few women who still after the 1960s, they also have contributed vastly to our understanding of the oceans and conservation, more importantly, conservation of the oceans. Okay, there is Maria Mitchell. Okay, so she was uh, in the late 1800s or early 1900s. She was the first uh, woman uh, professor in America. She was a professor of astronomy and uh, her findings, her astronomical findings helped oceanographers uh, for navigation. Uh, we have Sylvia Earle over here. She was also the first woman president of the NOAA, which is the National uh, Organization for uh, National Institute for Ocean and Atmospheric something. Uh, I'm forgetting. So NOAA, she was the first president, woman president. She also was a part of several underwater expeditions and uh, she went in these kind of submersibles. So that is Sylvia Earle. You have Rachel Carson over here. So she is a marine biologist. She wrote a very famous book, okay, uh, called as The Silent Spring, which explains a lot of marine life and calls for con uh, conservation of the oceans. Uh, Eugenie Clark was another American uh, woman who studied sharks and uh, a lot of what we know about today was published by this one lady, Eugenie Clark. So she's called the Shark Lady and she has a stamp, uh, a forever stamp uh, published by the USA. Two women I will also put here who don't have stamps in their honor, but they should. So one is uh, Mary Tharp who uh, helped us or she, were, she drew the ocean floor by hand even though she couldn't go on the expedition. So during the, um, or just after the war, when they were mapping the ocean floors, uh, as a woman, she couldn't go on the ship to map, but her teammates relayed information to her and she drew the map of the ocean floor by hand. So this is Mary Tharp. She is a cartographer. And the map we use of the ocean floor today is her map. And uh, the last is uh, Aditi Pant. Okay, she's an Indian. I can put more Indians, but uh, this lady, she uh, was the first woman from India to go to Antarctica. She is a physical oceanographer and a climate scientist. She's very much alive. And she should know that she is an inspiration to all women in science. So with this very, very long uh, lecture, <laughs> Thank you for staying with me. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? I can take it. Well, this is not a question, but I would like to compliment the author on a very excellent uh, uh, lecture, giving a lot of information regarding the development of the oceanography. So thank you, ma'am, for giving such a good lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It means a lot coming thank from you. you. Thank you, Dr. Nicole. Your expertise and engaging presentation style truly made the topic come to life. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, if no questions, are there any questions? There are no questions in the chat box. Very, very unique lecture indeed. So for tomorrow, uh, we have a lecture by Dr. Sudha from Pune University. She'll be talking about history of mineralogy. Uh, the same uh, all uh, same link will be used for all lectures throughout this week and the lectures can also be seen on mission devra youtube channel so can we conclude the lecture for today
please. Yes, yes, ma'am. Excuse me. Can Thank I? Thank you, everyone. Oh, yes. If, uh, um, who is that? As per our count, 130 cow, 130 total stamps. <laughs> uh, 130 total stamps. How many countries? <laughs> uh, countries we didn't, uh, <laughs> because it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, there were 53 countries over there. Stamps from 53 countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very Thank nice you. and informative lecture, ma'am. Thank you so much. So surely see you all tomorrow at the same time, 6 o'clock, same link. Thank you. Thank you.